Well, brethren, what if none of these little children and infants that were blessed here this afternoon had never been allowed to be born? What if abortions had been performed and their lives taken before they were born? Would that have been serious? I want you to think about that and just what is the value of these little human lives that have been blessed here this afternoon? And what is the value of an unborn life, human life? This afternoon I'm going to speak on a red-hot subject. Now, you may think it's only a material subject, a political subject. It's a red-hot political campaign subject right now, and that is the subject of abortion. Is it a sin? Is it a crime? Let me give you a definition of each word. A sin is the transgression of the spiritual law of God. A crime is the transgression of a law passed by a human group of men, a state legislature, a national congress, a lawmaking body, or another group of men who are lawmakers. Now, that question has been a red-hot question in this political campaign. I have done a television program on it that will be shown during the month of December, but after, uh, no, I believe perhaps November, maybe it'll be shown in November, but anyway, it'll be shown after the election. You can be sure of that, because I imagine that television stations would refuse to let it go on prior to the election they would call it political. And it is not political, I assure you. It's very much spiritual. But I can go a little further here this afternoon than what I'm going to say on the air. And I hope you'll hear in the program when it is aired, because it's going to shock a lot of people all over the United States. I can promise you that, and also in Europe. And I imagine that there will be thousands of very irate women that are going to want to see me dead as a result. It is a very serious question. Now, this question came up in the presidential debates, in the first debate. The question came up about whether an abortion is taking a human life. When does human life start? I think I can mention, I didn't mention on the air who I just said that one candidate said, but I think I can mention here among ourselves that the president said, he wasn't sure, but he had never seen yet anyone come forward with any proof that human life started any time after the first original conception, and if that is true, that it is a murder. The question was put to the Democratic candidate, and he said, quote, I do not know the answer to the question, when human life begins. 
Unquote. He said, I do not know. In essence, the president said the same thing, except he said he had heard no one say that human life started after conception. Many of them think human life doesn't start after con at conception until later, and they don't know just when it starts. Now, the Supreme Court of the United States is all mixed up on the question, and they can't decide. Now, that just goes to show you not only this question of abortion, but many, many other questions humans are trying to decide between good and evil, and they cannot decide. Judges can't decide. Lawmakers can't decide. Lawyers don't know the difference between right and wrong. Judges don't know the difference. And it's about time we realize that. It's only in the Word of God that you can find the difference between right and wrong. Now, a crime is merely the violation of a law made by human beings. But human laws are supposed to be based on God's laws. For example, I think it's generally considered that the number one crime is murder. Now, the sixth commandment of God's law says, Thou shalt not kill. But another law says, Remember the Sabbath day, and that's one thing they all want to forget. You won't find any human laws about that. Thou shalt not covet. You don't find any human laws about that. Thou shalt not steal. Now, they do pass laws on that. And so theft and stealing is a crime as well as a sin. But supposedly, men are supposed to base their laws on the law of God, but they don't because they don't understand the law of God, nor neither do they obey it, neither do they understand it at all. You have to go to the Word of God if you want to have understanding of the difference between right and wrong. Humans themselves do not understand it. Now, that is true about this matter of abortion. I was quite interested in an article that appeared in a magazine. My, many of you may not have heard of it. It's called the Us Magazine. Just, uh, I think a couple or three months ago, this article appeared, somewhat recent. And so I have asked Mr. Art Gilmore to narrate that article for us. And I want you to hear it. And I'm going to make some comments about it on the way as he proceeds. So I wish you would listen to this article, and it illustrates a point that I want to make very vividly. So will you proceed with the article now by Mr. Gilmore? Abortions Living Children Medical advances raise a new question for doctors and for women. What if the fetus is alive? The girl was 14 years old and five months pregnant, recalls the nurse. What got to me was suddenly hearing a baby cry. It shocked all of us. We were in the middle of an abortion procedure, and all of a sudden we had a crying baby on our hands. It was a boy, 21 weeks old, a baby considered unviable because it was being born so prematurely. He was placed in a basin. His arms and legs waved around for a while as he struggled for life. It took him longer to die than anyone thought. Months later, the nurse who witnessed the scene while working at the hospital affiliate of an Ivy League university is still shaken. I'd never been through that before, she says, and I never want to do it again. There is a chance, however, that she might. The prospect of an abortion resulting in birth has become an increasing possibility, one that is having a traumatic effect on medical personnel, 
lawyers, and pregnant women. Says Dr. Hugh R. K. Barber, Director of Obstetrics and Gynecology at New York's Lenox Hill Hospital, what happens when the fetus lives after it's removed from the womb is a question that may change the definition of abortion. They simply don't know the definition. Now they think they may have to change the human definition of what is abortion after all. And as we proceed with this article, you will see how mixed up human beings are. I mean, doctors, lawyers, judges, they just don't know right from wrong. Mr. Gilmore can proceed. This complex issue has a simple cause. Technology has outpaced the law. In 1973, the Supreme Court ruled that abortions could be performed up to the 28th week of pregnancy. The court's reasoning was that a 28-week-old fetus was viable, that is, at the stage where life may be continued indefinitely outside the womb by natural or artificial life-supportive systems. You see, even the Supreme Court of the United States is bewildered and they don't know the real answers to these things. If you don't go to the Word of God, they just don't know. Go ahead, Mr. Gilmore. During the last 11 years, rapid advances in neonatal care have pushed the point of viability back. It's now possible to keep a fetus alive at 23 weeks, and that boundary may soon be stretched even further. In March 1984, for example, a 19-week-old fetus was kept alive for nearly four days at a New York hospital. In addition, new abortion techniques, while safer for the mother, also increase the fetus's chances for survival. These two technological improvements raise a host of questions. If the fetus is born, does the doctor do everything possible to keep the child alive? Is the doctor obligated to the patient who wanted an abortion or to the fetus? Raising questions, questions they can't answer. They're bewildered and they don't know the answers. All right, continue with the article. If the child survives, who is legally responsible for it? The doctor, the hospital, or the mother? It should be pointed out that the numbers involved here are very small. To begin with, late-term abortions are rare. According to the Centers for Disease Control, of the 1.3 million abortions performed in the United States during 1980, only 13,000, less than 1%, were done after the 21st week. Second, live births resulting from abortions are even rarer. In New York State, 160,000 abortions were performed in 1982. Only 18 fetuses survived, a minuscule fraction. Third, the chance of a fetus growing to maturity is even rarer still. Although no figures are available, several sources estimate that no more than 50 women in the nation are raising children they tried to abort. Yet the fact that it has happened and the possibility that it will happen more often, makes living abortions the most closed-door topic in hospitals today. No other dilemma offers greater potential for controversial publicity, legal action, and emotional pain. One of the problems is that the three methods used in late-term abortions all have drawbacks. Saline injection induces labor and poisons the fetus. Prostaglandin also induces labor, but doesn't poison the fetus. Using this hormone-like substance is the safest method for the woman, but it is the one that's most likely to produce a live birth. The third alternative is dilation and evacuation, D&E, in which the fetus is dismembered in the womb. Obviously, this is the one process guaranteed to prevent live birth. But many doctors consider D&E to be repugnant and refuse to perform it. If a D&E is not done, then the doctor faces the prospect of an abortion turning into a birth. 
the physician also faces it without any clear guidelines. There is no specific position on the subject, says a spokesman for the Medical Society of the State of New York. Of course, doctors have a responsibility to sustain life where possible, according to the Hippocratic Oath. Some would say that if an abortion is intended, then the baby should die, notes Daniel Callahan, the Hastings Center's director. But at the same time, if an infant is born, it's then a patient. In this, the last year, there were a million and a half human lives snuffed out by abortion in the United States. Now, it was just mentioned in Mr. Gilmore's uh, reading of the article that a couple of three years ago it was a million point three in the United States. This last year it was a million and a half. But in Russia it was ten million. Now, it's that many lives, just like the lives of these little infants and children that were blessed here this afternoon were just snuffed out and murdered before they could be born. Now, as to whether human life had started yet at that time, I'm coming to that a little later. But let's proceed now with the rest of this article. One solution is to advise the woman before the abortion of the risks involved. If the fetus is alive and its chances for survival are good, the patient will have decided in advance what to do. Of everyone interviewed, including anti-abortion spokespeople, this solution received nearly unanimous endorsement. Uh, let's just proceed with it. The problem, however, is that according to the Centers for Disease Control, the majority of late-term abortions are performed on 15 to 19-year-old women. It can be argued that a frightened, unwed 15-year-old isn't legally or emotionally capable of making such a life-or-death decision. Can her family be asked to decide? Yes, but then who is legally responsible for the fetus? Its mother or its grandparents? People just simply cannot decide, and it's coming to the point where whatever the majority of people accept is considered to be the truth. If, if a thing is accepted, why that makes it true? Now, the public is coming to accept homosexuality, so homosexuality becomes perfectly good and right and righteous. The public is now accepting the fact that premarital sex is all right for 13, 14, 15-year-old children, and so it's promiscuous and is done, and it's the common thing. It's accepted by society. But society is not God, and society does not know right from wrong. Anyway, let's complete this article first, and then I have a lot more to say. What this means is that there are no answers at present. Lawyers believe that all anyone can do is speculate, as one put it, until there's a test case. Even pro-abortion groups have not taken a stand. Do you keep it alive or let it die? Indecision is burning us all out. Unfortunately, the questions are more easily asked than answered. This is from Us Magazine, July 2nd, 1984. That's the conclusion of the article, and I think it tells you a lot about a struggling humanity trying to get along, a humanity that is following Adam who took to himself the knowledge of good and evil and doesn't know either one properly. Well, now, let's get on with this subject. When does human life begin? We have to go to the Word of God to make that sure, and that's one thing I'm doing on the, on the television program that is going to open the eyes of a lot of people, because I think I can tell you 
that no other evangelist speaking on television would ever say what I have said, and they wouldn't dare say it. But let's go to the Bible. And we find God's purpose starting in the very first chapter of the Bible in Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word for God is Elohim, which is a plural word, more than one person. Now we come down to verse 26, and we find God says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. It wasn't one person, or one person he's saying, let me, it was a family of persons, more than one person, saying, let us make man in our image. Now, in verse 25, it says that God had made cattle after the cattle kind. They reproduce after their own kind. In verse 24, other animals were created and made to reproduce after each animal kind, dogs after the dog kind, and elephants after the elephant kind, and so on. But when we come to man, God made man to reproduce after the God kind. God was making man to, uh, in order to reproduce himself. He was reproducing himself in and by humanity made from the dust of the ground. Now, in the second chapter of Genesis, in verse 7, the eternal God formed man of the dust of the ground. And what he formed out of the ground, he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. And that was formed from the dust of the ground, became a living soul. So a soul came from the ground and is not spiritual, is not immortal, and it has only a temporary life, a chemical life, just as long as it breathes the breath of life, breathing air in and out of its lungs, and just as long as its heart beats blood. Because another scripture says the blood thereof is life thereof. So man only has a temporary life. But God offered that first man, Adam, immortal life. Now, God has immortal life. We read as to who and what God is in John 4, 24. God is a spirit. God is not made from the dust of the ground. God is composed of spirit. He is spirit. And that spirit is life. Now, Adam had to make a choice. So he was offered life in the form of the tree of life in the garden. And God wanted him to take it and said that he could freely eat of it and every other tree in the garden except one. That was the garden of the knowledge of good and evil. It was not apple. And the Bible doesn't tell us what kind of a fruit it was, but it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the tree of life was also a tree of knowledge, but that would have been the knowledge of God. And God would have imparted knowledge until people wouldn't be floundering around until they didn't know uh, when life begins, until they didn't know whether abortion is a sin or a crime or not until they would know whether homosexuality is wrong and whether premarital sex is wrong. But man does not know, because man had to make a choice, and man took to himself the knowledge of what is good and what is evil to decide for himself. And man is floundering around and has been ever since. Now, man was influenced by Satan the devil. Satan got to Adam's wife, Eve. He took of the fruit and gave to her husband, and he was standing right there, and he took it and did eat too. So, he was not deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam was not. But nevertheless, 
he did exactly what Satan tempted them to do. And so they were held captive. They were uh, taken for ransom. And consequently, God simply shut up the tree of life so that it was shut up until Jesus Christ, the second Adam, should come 4,000 years later. And no one was called to any kind of judgment to make a decision for eternal life one way or the other until Christ, the second Adam, came. Now, when Christ came, why did he come? What did he say? He said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The first Adam was offered life in the tree of life. He rejected it. The second Adam came that we might have life. The first Adam rejected that tree of life. The second Adam was born by the Spirit of God and had that life from conception. He was never conceived by a human father, but by God and through a human mother. But he had the Holy Spirit, and he never did once sin. He could have sinned, but he resisted it and did not sin. He, in one sense, he could not sin, but only because he would not. But he could have if he would have. But he himself had decided he would not. And that's the position that we all have to come to someday when we're born of God. But Jesus then said, I will build my church. Now, the word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia. And ecclesia merely is, is two different words. It means called out. They're called out ones. God called out those that were called that were chosen by God the Father as the first to come out of the world and to have the tree of life and to receive the impregnation of life in this life now, to be born of God and to become children of God. Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father who sent me draws them. Now, God the Father is the very one they were cut off from. When, when the Eternal closed up the tree of life, he closed up any access to God the Father. And the people under the Old Testament never knew of God the Father. They only knew of one person as God, and that was the one who became Jesus Christ. Ancient Israel did not know anything about God the Father. They only knew the one who became Christ. They knew of God only as one person, and the Jews to this day do not know anything about God the Father. Jesus came to reveal the Father. He has revealed the Father, and the Father is revealed to us in God's church. Now, Peter, in his epistle, says that... The judgment begins at the household of God with the church. So the church is being judged. In other words, we're being judged to whether we can have eternal life or not. The rest of the world is simply shut off from life. They do not have any opportunity as yet. But the time is coming when they will, because God said from the very creation of the earth, that it was appointed to all men once to die, and after that the judgment, and judgment will come to all by a resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, 23, and 24, you read that as in Adam all die, and certainly all have been dying in Adam, so in Christ the same all shall be made alive by a resurrection from the dead. They'll be brought back to life, and that means back to simply uh, mortal, temporary life once again. 
And then they'll be brought to judgment, and in that judgment, the book of life will be present. And they will have an opportunity then to choose the tree of life, which has been denied to them ever since Adam sinned. Now, when does divine life begin? Because human life is merely the type, an exact type and picture of the divine life of being born of God. Now, when does the life of God start? Does it start at uh, impregnation? Or does it start during gestation somehow? Or does it start at birth? Well, we read in the eighth chapter of Romans, for example, in verse 9, that uh, uh, we're not even a Christian if we don't have the Holy Spirit of God, but only those who have the Spirit of God are Christ's and are Christians. Verse 11, if the Spirit of God is dwelling in us, he that raised up Jesus from the dead will also quicken our mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in us at the proper time at the second coming of Christ in the time of the resurrection. And we will be made then immortal God beings. In verse 14 of the 8th chapter of Romans, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are now the sons of God. They're already children of God. Now, I'm going to show you later they're not born yet. Now, in um, 1 John, the third chapter, and verse 2, I believe it is, Behold, already now we already are the children of God. We're already the begotten children of God. And God's life has been begotten into us. Brother, and I can stand up, sit up here, rather, and tell you, I have divine, immortal, God life within me in the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible says that's just like an earnest payment. An earnest payment is just a small part of a down payment you make on a piece of property when you buy it. It's not the full payment. And that doesn't mean you're a possessor yet. I'm not a possessor. I'm not an inheritor. I'm only uh, a begotten uh, heir to inherit at the time of birth. I'm in the p stage of gestation, the same stage that an unborn fetus is, whether it is uh, an embryo or a fetus. It's an embryo for the first few weeks, and when it begins to take on human form, then it's called a fetus. But it is the child of its parents. And that's the exact type of divine life. And we, if we have the Holy Spirit of God, we already are the children of God. But we are not yet born. Now, we have a lot of Christians on our hands that claim they're born-again Christians. And, of course, we have our Jerry Falwells and all of them, and, of course, they think they're born again. I'm sorry, but I have to inform them they don't know what they're talking about. And I think they're going to, they're going to hear of this program of mine that's coming out, and they're not going to like it either. I can't help that. It's the truth. And the truth is going to go out whether they like it or whether they don't. God says, cry aloud and spare not and show my people their sins. And I've been called as a watchman to warn the people of their sins. And I'm sorry if it has to be the only voice that is crying out with the truth. I wish there were a thousand other voices crying out with the truth. Why? 
why, why, oh, why is it that the others simply go along with Satan the devil and won't get over on God's side and come out with the truth? Well, let's just see now. What about being born again? There was the Pharisee Nicodemus. This was early in Jesus' ministry when Jesus was on earth. Nicodemus sneaked in by night to see Jesus. And he questioned about this thing of getting into the kingdom of God. He didn't understand what it meant to get into the kingdom of God, but Jesus was preaching about the kingdom of God. And so Jesus got right to the point. He said, you can't enter into or you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you are first born again. Why, being born again, Nicodemus couldn't quite grasp that. He said, well, I, I know I was born once, but how can I shrink back up into uh, almost nothing and enter into my mother's womb and be born again? Well, Jesus didn't mean that kind of a birth. He says, you were born as a human, and that which is born of the flesh is flesh, human or flesh. God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's what you are. And flesh comes out of the dust of the ground. But in verse 6 of John 3, Jesus said, That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Is no longer flesh. Is no longer human. He will be spirit. What is God? John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and that which is born of the spirit is also spirit, as God is spirit. God is not made of the dust of the ground. God is not human. He doesn't have a heart pumping blood. He doesn't have to breathe air to live. He just has self-containing life automatically, and that's the way we shall be when we are born again. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 50, same thing. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither can it enter into the kingdom of God. You have to be born again, born of the Spirit. This mortal must put on immortality. You must become spirit. And in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you'll be changed into spirit. Now, you'll come in with a total different body. In Philippians, the third chapter, and I think it's verse 21. It's, I think it's the last verse in the third chapter of Philippians. At that time, this mortal will put on immortality and... God will change our corruptible, vile bodies, which when they die, will, uh, well, unless a mortuary gets hold and takes all the, drains the blood out of your body and puts some fluid in there to keep it from rotting, you will rot and decay, and the foul stench and foul odor will almost knock someone over in about two or three days. You're corruptible, subject to rotting and decaying. But this corruptible, then, must put on incorruption, and God will change our vile bodies, as they are corruptible, like unto his glorious body. Now, what's his glorious or glorified body like? You read in the first chapter of Revelation that his eyes are like flames of fire and his face shines like the sun, full strength, so strong to put your eyes out if you were standing in front of him and looked right at him. And that's the way we shall be when we are born again. And, brethren, if I may just say that among ourselves here privately, I don't think Jerry Falwell looks quite like that yet. <laughs> or for that matter, Billy Graham or 
uh, Oral Roberts or some more of those fellows. And I wish they would wake up and listen to the truth and begin to preach it themselves a little bit. Well, anyway, that proves absolutely that God life is already in us from the time of begettal, in the time of conception. And so human life is the exact type of it, and human life starts at the very instant of conception. And anyone who takes it in an abortion is taking a human life. Now, taking a human life in that sense, the Bible calls murder. I have to call a spade a spade. I have to call it as it is. And that's what it is. But now, why is it important, brethren? Why is it important? Maybe it's not important to take a, a, a fetus like that. That little fellow that waved his arms and legs and had a struggle for a, to uh, took him a little longer to die than they thought it would in an abortion. Why is it wrong to abort that life? What is the value of a human life? What's the value of the lives of all these little children that were blessed here this afternoon? You know, David, King David, must have been out one night on a clear night. The sky was clear, and you could see all of the stars. And he looked up and he saw what he could see, the whole universe, and he got to thinking. And he thought, how great is God to have created all that whole great vast universe. And then he got to thinking, here he was, just a mere little, uh, he must look less than the size of a little ant to God. And what is a man that God would be concerned about him? What of one of these little babies that were blessed this afternoon that God should be concerned about them? What is that unborn fetus that someone is going to operate on and kill and take its life away before it can be born? That is repeated again in the second chapter of Hebrews. And in verse 5, it gives you the introduction of what it's going to speak on from that point on, on the world to come. And the world to come will not be under the dominion of angels. So it's speaking about the world to come, and then it says, What is man that God would be concerned about him? What are these little infants who were blessed this afternoon that God is concerned? How important are they? I don't know any of them that I recall just now, but one, I know one little lady, the daughter of Ross, who plays the piano for you and who directs the music for the young ambassadors. She's a cute little lady, just born a few weeks ago. But how valuable is that life? Then again, that question is asked. What is man that God, and a human being, that God should be concerned? When God is so great that he can form stars that actually are actual suns, hundreds and hundreds of times larger than our sun, and many planets much larger than this Earth, like both Saturn and Jupiter are much larger than this Earth, but there's still bigger ones on other planets and other Milky Ways. What is man? And then it says that God has made us to have dominion over the works of his hands. And the works of his hands is what you see out there in that whole vast universe. The great, vast universe 
it just keeps going on and on and on. And this earth is only a little speck in the whole universe, how, how it's so great. And it says that God has given man dominion over the work of his hands, and then that he gave him the work over his hands, he kept back nothing that is not put under man's dominion ultimately. Then it says, but we see not yet all the things, the whole universe under man. But man is to be over and be God over the whole vast universe. That's how important is one single human life. That's how important is that little embryo or that fetus that they murder in an abortion. It's a future God. It is one that can rule over everything. And in Romans the 8th chapter, you read of how the whole universe is suffering corruption and decay and waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. We're not revealed yet. We're not born yet. We're only in the embryo or the fetus stage so far. But that life is so important that we're going to rule over all of the planets. How are the planets now? I knew that if I could ever go to the planet Mars, that I wouldn't see a life there like people think, and like they think maybe there are human beings living there, and maybe it's a very fertile place. No, I said, if I could ever see Mars and could ever go there, I would find decay, wasteness and emptiness and decay. And so finally, right out of Pasadena, almost within eyeshot from this auditorium right here, over at JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they made the unmanned spacecraft that was able to land on the surface of Mars and send back photographs right on the surface of Mars. And the first photographs were not shown up at the JPL laboratories. They were shown on this stage right up ahead of me here on the screen. In this auditorium, at about five or seven minutes after five in the morning, one morning, just a few years ago, I got up early that morning, I was here. And with the scientists from the JPL laboratory who were here, I got to see those first photographs the same time they did. And they were shown in this auditorium. And what we saw was decay and corruption. And the whole universe is in a state of decay, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, which are now human beings, and we're in the gestation period as embryos or as fetuses of the divine being of God. That's how great is a human life. Brethren, was I speaking on politics this afternoon, or was I telling you about the purpose of God and about salvation and about the value of a human life? We need to wake up and realize how serious some of these things are. And as long as God gives me the breath, I'm going to try to shout this out to the world, whether they like it or whether they don't. I think God wants them to hear. You, brethren, are part of the brethren all around the world that have gotten behind me to choose me, shall we say, or has God chosen you? I guess that's more the way it really is. To set me 
as a man to give a warning. And if I don't warn the people, God would require their blood at my hand. But if I do, and if they heed the warning, they will save their souls, and maybe they can become God, too, in the family of God, the great kingdom of God. But if not, they have been told, and we have done our duty. Brethren, let's carry on in the work of God. There's much to be done yet to get this wonderful message of the gospel of the kingdom of God. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world only hears the gospel about Jesus Christ, and there's all the difference in the world. One is the gospel from Satan, the other is the gospel from Jesus Christ and from God the Father.